my middle son, Laith, loves good guys and bad guys. He's at an age right now where it's all about good guys and bad guys. In fact, if you were to come over to our house and to go downstairs and play with him, he'd ask you, are you a good guy or are you a bad guy? And if you're a good guy, that's good. (laughs) But if you're a bad guy, that's bad. Uh, Because of that, he loves superheroes. Took him to see the Avengers this spring. And there's this scene in the Avengers where Loki is shoved through the glass by the Hulk and the Hulk comes in after him. And Loki stands up and he says, Enough! Uh, I will not be bullied. And about that time, the Hulk grabs him by the leg and goes, Bam, 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 bam. My little boys, Kelton's five, Lace four, they're sitting there in this packed theater watching this. And to the horror of his father, with everyone in there, my son Lath goes, Oh yeah! Real loud. He loves superheroes. Another one of his favorites is Thor. In fact, were you to come over to our house and to go downstairs to play with the Nerf arsenal that we have, uh, he would grab his Thor hammer. And if you come and played with him down there, you might get to experience the Thor hammer up close and personal. Uh, he, he loves being Thor. He watched the movie Thor, and he loves the scene where the destroyer comes down to earth to destroy mankind. And Thor walks up to the destroyer and he says, take me instead. Don't destroy mankind, destroy me in their place. And the destroyer acquiesces and backhands Thor and the life is knocked out of Thor as his lifeless body goes back on the street. The scene cuts to the father who has a tear running down his eye. And then the voice of the father comes on. And the hammer of Thor comes up from the earth and is restored to Thor's hand. And Thor is resurrected. At which time Thor then destroys the destroyer. I hope our Christian studies students or our Christians have seen that plot before. I hope that plot sounds familiar of a son that comes to earth to die in the place of mankind, upon which time, three days later, by the Father's love, he's resurrected and destroys death. I've often watched and I've thought, you know, Hollywood, they love the plot of the Bible. They'll never admit it, but if you watch some of the best movies, they copy the plot of the Bible. Because they understand there's something about that romantic, agape, unconditional love of God for man that calls to the souls of mankind. In fact, the greatest movie ever, uh, at least some people think so, I don't, Uh, But it's the greatest seller ever, the Titanic. Uh, I've never seen that movie, by the way. I don't have four hours of my life to waste watching a ship sink. But anyway, when the movie came out, it was the most popular movie of all time, and a lot of the members of my church went to see it, and I was pastoring, and so one of the men said, hey, Do you want to see it? I said, let me pray about it. No, I don't want to see it. Uh, He said, but don't you want to know what's going on? I said, sure. He said, if you'll watch the last 30 minutes of it, you'll get the plot. So I thought, okay, I'll watch the last 30 minutes of it. And I've not seen it, but from what I can tell, the plot is that there's a person in bondage. They're enslaved to someone. They can't get out. They can't get free. And someone else, by his love, would save her from that bondage. In fact, he would even give up his own life and die in the freezing seas to save her. At which time, 
She spends the rest of her life thinking about Him and longing to see Him again. And then we see this scene at the end of the show, which is perhaps the most foolish scene in all of moviedom ever, where she takes a beautiful, huge blue diamond and drops it in the ocean. Really? Honestly? Hello? But the diamond symbolizes her life that's passing. And you see it go down and it hits the Titanic and then all of a sudden the Titanic is more glorious than ever before. And there she is walking through the Titanic and she walks into the banquet hall and there's her friends and her family members, but she doesn't stop to look at them. She looks up the stairs to see the one that she's lived her life for and she's longed to see ever since He saved her. Once again, Christian study students, I hope you recognize that plot. All Christians should recognize that plot. You see, the gospel is rightly been called the greatest love story ever told. It is about God in His unfailing love for us, pursuing each and every one of us. Many of us don't want to be pursued. Many of us want to say, God, leave me alone. I don't want what you've got. Leave me alone. But God in His faithful love, knowing that what He has for us is better than what we think we want, continues to pursue us. Perhaps no passage in all of Scripture better presents the Gospel than Leviticus 16. You say, really? Leviticus? Yes, Leviticus chapter 16. I would argue that there's not even a passage in the New Testament that presents the Gospel more clearly than Leviticus 16. Leviticus has rightly been called the most New Testament book in all of the Old Testament. And so if you will, notice with me in verse 1 of chapter 16. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Then Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. And he shall put the linen holy tunic the linen trousers on its body, and he shall be girded with a linen sash and with the linen turban. He shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his body in water and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats, present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to be it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. We'll stop there. Let's just share with you what we're going to see in the text today. We're going to see in the text today that the high priest in many ways is going to represent the person of Jesus Christ. And the two goats that are mentioned are going to represent the work of Jesus Christ. And so what we have is, depending on the time of Israel, there was a tabernacle or a temple, uh, perhaps very similar, maybe like this, except let's say that this was the tabernacle or temple, and back there where some of you are seated, that would be the front. The main street of Jerusalem would be down uh, behind y'all. 
And as you walk down Main Street of Jerusalem, there were no doors to the tabernacle or temple. It was just open with pillars, and you could actually look in. And if you looked into the tabernacle or temple, on one uh, side you'd see the lampstands, on the other side you'd see the table of showbread, and down at the front, down here, there'd be this massive curtain comes all the way across. This curtain, over 12 inches thick, would stretch across, and behind the curtain was the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. Ark, just meaning something, a, a wooden container, if you will. Covenant, the covenant that God made with man inside that ark. Of course, uh, the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses, and also the rod of Aaron, God's covenant with man. And upon that rock, at the mercy seat, was God. So there was this curtain between man and God. On the front of the curtain, as you looked in, you could see an altar of incense, which would blow incense back behind the curtain. The covenant of God. Go back to the covenants. We'll look at Abraham's covenant. Remember when God made that covenant with Abraham? Covenants were made between individuals at that time to basically say, I'm going to keep my word to you. If I say it, I'm going to keep it. And so one of the things that would happen is they'd make a blood covenant where they would take animals and they would cut the animals in two and they would lay one half of the animal on one side of a little trench and another half of the animal on the other side. And they'd let these animals bleed into the trench so that the trench had blood. One individual would stand at one end of the trench and the other at the other, and they would walk towards each other through the blood. And with their blood-stained feet, they would meet in the middle. And they would say, you've got my word that I will do this. And if I don't do this, may what happened to these animals happen to me. When you look at that covenant God made with Abraham, it's interesting because as God comes through that trench, uh, through this pillar of smoke, this fire, this darkness that comes through, Moses doesn't walk through. Just God. They don't meet in the middle. It's as if God is saying to Moses, Hey Moses, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And I can't break my word. I'm God. I could never fail. I'm God. But when you break your word, when you live your life in such a way that I'm not your God, may what happened to these animals happen to me. Abraham, I'm going to die for your sin. That's the covenant idea, the Ark of the Covenant. And here on this special day, God tells Moses, hey Moses, tell Aaron the high priest not to come back into the Holy of Holies at any time. In fact, there was only one day in the entire Jewish calendar when the high priest could go in to meet with God. And on that day, he had to wash, he had to change clothes, and there even had to be smoke that covered him going through. It was the day that we're reading about in Leviticus 16. Yom Kippur, Yom, Hebrew, day, Kippur, atonement, the day of atonement. And on this very special day, God tells Moses, listen, Aaron can't come in on any other day. He can't come behind the veil. He can't come to see God. It's as if God is saying, Stay out. You're a sinner. You sin. I'm holy, God says. I'm pure. Stay out. Why? Because my sin, in the words of Millard Erickson, God is allergic to. God can't be in the presence of sin. If God allowed my evil, my sin, no matter how good I am, if God allowed my sin into heaven, it would be less than perfect. If God allowed my sin into His presence to stain Him, to taint Him, He would not be God and He cannot stop being God. So He says, stay out. You're sinful. I'm God. Stay out. Don't you come in here. In fact, 
in Jewish history, they would actually tie a rope around the high priest on this special day so that if he went in and somehow he went in wrongly, God could strike him down for going in wrongly. No one wanted to go in after him because God would strike them down. So they'd tie a rope to pull him out. It's very serious. God is saying, I'm holy. You're sinful. Stay out. You might say, well, Dr. Reynolds, I'm not that bad. I mean, I have a few sins, but I'm not that bad. Any sin would make God less than God. Any sin He allowed into heaven would contaminate heaven. You know, I was single for a long time. I was, uh, in fact, I was single till I was 33 years old. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus gave His life up when He was 33 too. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't tell my wife I said that. That's a joke. Uh, but uh, uh, but I was single till I was 33, so I used to wash and dry my own clothes. You know, it's interesting. I don't know why, but I just decided that when my clothes got on the rinse cycle in the washing machine, I wouldn't go and get a bucket full of dirt and pour it in there. In fact, when it got on the rinse cycle, I wouldn't even go and get a spoonful of dirt. Because any dirt, whether it's a spoonful or a bucketful, would make it less than clean. Folks, you may be good, but your sin has tainted you. And God says, stay out. I'm God, you're not. Stay out. And then on this special day, we're told that Aaron would take two goats or would bring the two goats outside and they would cast lots for these goats. One goat was the goat to the Lord. It was the goat that would come and uh, outside of the tabernacle or temple, right outside back there would be an altar. And they'd take that goat to the altar and Aaron would pray the sins of the children of Israel over that goat. And symbolically, we would see our sins transferred to that goat. You know that cheating you did yesterday? You know that lying you did last week? You know the gossip, you know the sexual sins. Those sins that even right now God is reminding you of, outside we would be gathered and Aaron would say the sins of the people yesterday, this week, this month, this year be transferred. We'd symbolically see our sins being transferred to this goat and then this goat was the goat to the Lord. It was to appease the anger of God. God is angry when you and I break His law. We've offended a holy God. When God says not to do something and we do it, we've offended a holy God. And an offense against an infinite God demands an infinite penalty. That's just just. If you killed a person and you came to the courthouse and they said, all right, you killed, you murdered someone today, that'll be a dime. You'd say, whoa, time out, that's not fair. But now if you killed a person and you went to the courthouse and they say, hey, you murdered someone, you're going to get killed today, you'd say, you know what, that's fair. Huh. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. God's a just God. And when you and I offend an infinite God, it demands an infinite penalty, which is eternity separated from God. And so outside, our sin would be transferred to this goat and that anger of God at our sin would be poured out on that goat and Aaron would slit the throat of the goat. The blood would be drained and the wrath of God would be satisfied as it's poured out on that goat for our sin. The goat didn't do anything wrong. It's a picture of the work of Christ. And then the high priest would take that blood and he would walk in too. And he would have some incense going before him, providing a covering as he came in to meet with God. And he'd sprinkle that blood of the goat seven times. You can read it there later on, there in Leviticus 16, on his way up to the mercy seat. And then when he got to the mercy seat, he sprinkled it seven times. And I think God is saying to us, the way to God is through the blood of the Lamb. You don't get to God, you don't get to heaven by going to church. You don't get to heaven by being baptized. You don't get to heaven by being good. The only way to get to heaven is by the blood of the Lamb. And when He sprinkled it on the mercy seat, as God on the mercy seat looks back up at Aaron, He sees him through the blood. 
His wrath has been satisfied. Aaron is now pure because of the blood. But then there's this scapegoat. It's an interesting word in the Hebrew, Azazel. It's a word in Jewish tradition that has also been used for the place of the chief demons. Azazel. This goat also would be on this very special day would be out there and Aaron would pray the sins of the people over this goat too. And then this goat, a kid goat, means it hasn't reached its full adulthood yet. It was cut off. An interesting term used also of Isaiah. A Hebrew term that Isaiah used to speak of the Messiah. He was cut off. It's a word Isaiah used that means before he experienced everything, before his time was complete, he was cut off. Did you ever stop and think Jesus never got to experience the joy of little feet running up to his bed and saying, Good morning, Daddy. Did you ever stop to experience Jesus never got to experience the joy of marriage? Well, he was God, yes, but he was also a man. And he had all the feelings and desires that you and I have except without sin. He was cut off. That kid goat would be taken from its parents and the sins would be traded uh, transferred, if you will, over to that goat. And there you and I are. We're in the streets of Jerusalem and we're watching that cheating we did. We're watching that lying. We're watching those sexual sins. We're watching that gossip. We're watching that hate. We're watching that anger. We're watching our wrath. All of our sins, we're watching it transferred to this goat. And that goat becomes our sin. And then depending on the time in Israel's history, a righteous man would take that goat from a one day to six day journey into the wilderness. But this man would then take our sin and he'd start walking out of Jerusalem. And there you and I are and we're watching that sin we committed yesterday. And it's going. It's going. It's going. It's gone. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west, God removes our sin. And that little kid goat would be taken to left to die out in the wilderness all by itself. Perhaps it would bleat for its parents, reminding us of the time when Jesus, all by Himself, Die on the cross for our sins and cry out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 1933, Mexico City. On a Sunday afternoon, what they normally did in Mexico City, they went to a bullfight. Bullfight is a sport that is, is not a good sport. Uh, and if you like bullfighting, I'm sorry, but I, I don't think it's a proper sport because of what they actually do to the animals. Uh, I love rodeo. I love horses. I'm okay with that. But in bullfighting, they actually kill the bull. And the sport of bullfighting, especially back in those days, the bull would charge the matador, and either the matador or the bull would die on this day. But on a Sunday afternoon, the bull would charge the matador would step aside and thrust some sort of a sharp instrument into the bull's side. And after doing this numerous times, the bull would literally bleed to death. Uh, but on this day in 1933, the bull charged, the matador stepped aside, thrust something into the side of the bull, and the crowd went crazy and cheered. And the little boy started cheering, and he fell over the side of the arena down into the arena. A hush came across the crowd as they watched this little boy and they hoped maybe the bull won't see him. Because the matador was on this end, the child was on this end, the bull was in the middle. To the horror of the crowd, the bull did see him. He turned towards the little child and began 
pawing the dirt. Immediately the crowd erupted and began telling the child, son, go this way, go that way, come here, come here, save yourself. And the boy stood there in horror. The bull began charging the little boy. And right at the last minute, a teenager jumped out of the stands. At full speed, he picked up the little boy and began running to the side of the arena. The bull changed its direction and began following the teenager. The teenager lifted the bull up to the hands reaching down. And as he handed the boy off, the bull's horn found its mark. And it impaled the teenager into the side of the arena. And the teenager said as he died, is the boy okay? Ladies and gentlemen, that teenager took the place of that little boy. The boy couldn't save himself. Someone had to come down and take his place to save him. The person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus came from heaven. And on the cross, He satisfied the wrath of God. And on the cross, He removed our sin. If you'll read the rest of Leviticus 16, however, you'll see something else happens at the end of the day. You remember, verse 3 or 4, we were talking about He would put on this uh, special tunic, this sash, and this turban. You see, on a normal day, the high priest would be wearing his purple robes. He'd wear that breastplate. He'd walk down the streets of Jerusalem with those jewels on his shoulder. In fact, if you and I were there, we'd see him coming and we'd say, there comes royalty. There comes regality. There comes the high priest. But on Yom Kippur, he would take off his royal robes. He would put on just white linen. In the Old Testament, white symbolized at least two things. One was purity. The other was humility. And so here would come this high priest on this day that would be clothed in humility. But at the end of the day, as you read the rest of Leviticus 16, he takes off those blood-stained garments. Context is very clear that he puts back on his royalty. You see, the beautiful thing about the person of Jesus Christ is that yes, he humbled himself, but he humbled himself and therefore God hath given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to the glory of the Father, Jesus is Lord. You see, it didn't end on the cross. But three days later, he rose from the dead. And it doesn't even end there. Because there's coming a day when Jesus will come back to earth. And this time, He's not coming back to be judged by man. He's coming back to judge man. And this time, He's not coming as the Lamb of God. He's coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And this time, He's not coming riding a donkey. He's coming riding a white horse. And upon his side and upon his thigh will be written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Young people, Jesus died, but He is God. Yes, He's loving. But we ask ourselves, for what did He die? Well, Dr. Reynolds, He died to save us from our sins. And that's true. But He did more than that. He died to save you to Himself. Let's go back 2,000 years ago. That day that Jesus died. We're sitting in our houses in Jerusalem. All of a sudden, there's an earthquake. Now, if there was an earthquake here in Cleveland, a lot of us would get out and walk down to see the damage. So we would in that day. We'd get out of our house and start walking down the street of Jerusalem on the day that Jesus died to see the damage. We'd walk down Main Street and here's the temple and we'd look into the temple to see if there's any damage. In our entire life, we've looked into the temple and we've seen the message, stay out. We've seen the curtain, 
Stay out. I'm God. You're sinful. Stay out. But on this day, when Jesus died, the Bible says that that curtain was ripped from top to bottom. We walk by on those streets of Jerusalem. We look into the temple. And there's God. It's as if God said, come in. I want to talk to you. I want to visit with you. I want to have fellowship with you. I want you to enjoy love, life, joy, peace, patience. I want you to enjoy existence because that's who I am. Let me ask you, those of you who are saved, turn your phone down, get away from the computer, get away from social networks, and you spend an hour or two with Jesus. He didn't come just to save you from hell. He came to save you to Himself. That you and I could experience life. But we're going to do the invitation just a little bit differently today. Have you ever thought why is it Dr. Cantor and Mr. Epling showed up as coaches for the wrestling match the other night? Now, let me just state up front to uh, Coach Bailey, I'm not sure how wise it was to have Dr. Uh, Canner be a wrestling coach. Uh, I'm just stating that, all right? I'm, I'm being honest here, if I can be honest with you. I mean, I, I love Dr. Canner. He's like a brother to me. If you said, hey, he's going to lead a Bible study, I said, you got the man. If you said he's going to be a president of a school, I'd say, you got him. But a wrestling coach? <laughs> really? <laughs> Anyway, uh, why would he give up time with his wife and children to come out here? And students, why is it that faculty and staff give up time away to come and watch you in your music performances, in your athletic events, and things that are important to you? I think you know the answer. It's because we care about you and we want you to know we care about you. And when we show up to do special things for you, and when we sacrifice time at our homes and places, we're saying to you, you're important to us. I care about you. And during this invitation, basically, I want you to know we care about you. And so I'm going to speak directly to some individuals because I think you know I care about you. And so because of that, I'm going to ask you to hear me. If you're not saved, don't gamble on tomorrow. You are a fool to gamble on tomorrow. This invitation is specifically for you. And I want to speak directly to our international students for a moment. Please do not confuse Christianity with a country. If you're an international student and you're not saved, don't assume that if you get saved, you become an American. That is the furthest thing from the truth as there is. Jesus was not an American. He was a Jew. And He came to save the whole world so that when you read in the book of Revelation that from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, there will be those who praise Him. I'm saying this because I care about you. Please don't confuse that. To our national students who may not be saved, please don't confuse Christianity with a religion. Do you know Christianity, if you were to call it a religion, is the only one that says you don't get to heaven by good works. Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, you can go down the list. Cults, they all say, be good, go to nirvana or heaven or wherever. Christianity says you can't. Because it's not about a religion. It's not about doing things. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's what I want to do during our invitation. RAs, if God's laid someone on your heart and you've been praying to them, and praying for them, 
and you feel it would not be too offensive to them to go to them, I'm going to ask you just to go to them. Not just RA, CLCs, anyone in here. And just say to them, I care about you. I want to make sure you're going to heaven with me. Are you? And those of you who aren't saved, the invitation, you don't have to wait for someone to come to you. If you know an RA, if you know a faculty member, they may not even be standing up here. There will be some. But you find them. You go to the end. You find someone you're comfortable with because I care about you. And I can honestly say before every one of you, on behalf of the president and the staff here, we do love you. And if getting on my knees and pleading with you would get you to heaven, I would do it right now. My desire is that you go to heaven. And so during the invitation, I want to give you the freedom to go whoever you feel comfortable talking with. And here's something else I want to do. I'm going to ask everyone who's saved, whether it's at your seat or at the altar, I'm going to ask you to come and pray for one of your fellow students that you don't know is saved. And sometime today, I'm going to ask you to put feet to your prayers. And I'm going to ask you to go to that student and say, you know what? I'm just doing what Dr. Reynolds asked me to do today. I care about you. I love you. I just want you to know I prayed for you. I hope you're going to heaven. And then see what happens from there. Let God take care of it. Finally, I want to say to the Christian who's not spent time with God or who's in sin or who's struggling, this time's for you. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, our vocalists and instrumentalists will come forward. Dr. Canner will be closing the invitation as he feels led. But I'm going to ask us all to stand and I'm going to pray. And at the end of our prayer, you have the freedom to do whatever God leads you to do. Let's stand and pray. Jesus, thank you for the glorious gospel. The good news. You died on the cross for our sins. And God, every one of us in this room, myself at the front of the line, says, we're sinners. I can't point my finger at students and say how sinful they are because I am so much more sinful. God, thank You that going to heaven isn't based on not sinning because we all sin based on the precious gift of God through the Lamb of God who came to take away our sins. And Father, I pray in Jesus' now for our name right now for our students. If there's one or two or five or ten who's here today and they don't know You as Lord and Savior, I ask You in Jesus' name to save them today. God, I ask for those of us who've been unfaithful to share our faith with others. I ask in Jesus' name today to give us the boldness to share our faith. And God, anything that you've done in our hearts right now today, we ask you to give us the courage to obey how you're leading us. In Jesus' name, amen. You obey the Lord.